Celebrities who were kicked out for being naughty or controversial isn't as common to hear these days, but these celebrities had good and bad reasons. Eartha Kitt is one of the most legendary actresses of her time, and my absolute favorite Catwoman besides the amazing Julie Newmar and the lovely Michelle Pfeiffer. But aside her incredible unique voice, her charm, her wit and passion, as well as her success performing in nightclubs, Broadway, acting and singing, she was blacklisted from the industry for some time. Between the 1950s to 1960s, Eartha Kitt had already involved herself within community by establishing the Kittsville Youth Foundation, an organization that started as a response to the utter frustration of the Watts riot, an unfortunate event in LA where police brutality echoed a week of civil unrest. Because of her charity, she as well supported another organization called Rebels with a Cause in Washington, and these organizations allowed her to collaborate with proficient and dedicated social workers to help minors like inner city kids, poverty stricken areas, and under the influence young adolescents, as well as youth who suffered from lack of economic support, lack of food, or shelter. And so she had provided sponsorship and aided in money for these organizations to teach these young men and women a trade to avoid returning to the streets. And fun fact, this organization has stretched far as meeting young adolescents all over the United States and the indigenous youth population in Canada and all over the world. Eartha Kitt was extremely proud of her work as she was also known as an activist for the rights of these young people, from LGBT to racial discrimination, but why was she exiled? Well, on January 18th, 1968, she was invited to a luncheon with the other notable ladies to discuss the issues of youth in America. And considering her dedication and work, she assumed that's what the luncheon was going to be about. Instead, it was about Mrs. Lady Bird Johnson, who was the wife of President Lyndon B. Johnson, talking about the bare minimum. Frustrated, Eartha patiently waited for her turn and finally expressed her concerns, the real concerns why the youth in America is suffering, and more importantly, criticized Lady Bird Johnson and her husband's administration on their lack of accountability of the Vietnam War. Her famous remark was, The children of America are not rebelling for no reason. They are not hippies for no reason at all. We don't have what we have on Sunset Boulevard for no reason. They were rebelling against something, and there are so many things burning the people of this country, particularly mothers, as they feel they are going to raise sons, and I know what it's like, and you have children on your own, Mrs. Johnson. We raise children and send them to war. After an interview asked if she regrets her statement, she said no, why would I do that? And she meant what she said. As a result, the media backlashed Eartha Kitt, saying she made Mrs. Johnson cry when she said the woman never cried ever. And the media outlets paid by the CIA and the president needed social empathy, and so Eartha was jobless until she found out why. She then exiled herself to Europe where she thrived successfully only to return in 1978 was she able to go back to the US with still a successful and charitable woman. And like speaking of amazing activists, Lena Horne was one of many like Eartha Kitt who was very vocal only to be shunned for speaking out against violence. In the 1940s, she was known to be the first African American star on stage and on screen, but offset she was active in speaking out. She still ran up against the institutional racism, however her frustration eventually drove her to join up with a variety of activist groups, many of which were populated by political radicals and communists. Though never a party member herself, Horn was found guilty by association and blacklisted after her name appeared in the Red Channels in 1950. Unable to work in television or film, she spent the next few years touring as a nightclub and cabaret singer. She also fought to clear her name by publicly repudiating against communism and undertaking a letter writing campaign to prominent journalists and entertainment figures. And the plan worked. Horn's reputation was slowly rehabilitated and by the late 1950s she was once again appearing on television variety shows and recording hit records. Despite her brush with the black List, she still remained a political activist and later even took part in civil rights protests during the 1960s. During World War II, when entertaining the troops for the USO, she refused to perform for segregated audiences or for groups in which German POWs were seated in the front of black servicemen. According to her Kennedy Center biography, because the US Army refused to allow integrated audiences, she staged her show for a mixed audience of black US soldiers and white German POWs. Seeing the black soldiers had been forced to sit in the back seat, she would walk off stage to the first row where the black troops were seated and perform with the German behind her. She understood her privileges of being a star and knew it was important to in representation to allow black voices to be heard and seen. She's noted in her words, maybe it's because I'm a black woman, but maybe because I am a woman, I don't see as much as I wanted. I don't see it happening as much as it happened to us 10 years ago and I think it's worsened and it's like what the French say, the more we change, the more it stays the same. And I'm hearing the same old stories and seeing the same old incidents I saw before 1960 and when Paul Robinson told me, that's alright, your grandchildren will see it better, he didn't know that I'd still have to wait. Now I've got a great grandson and wonder how long he's going to have to wait. Her legacy is noted with her many works, not just in film and cinema, but in activism as well, inspiring others to also use their voice for good. And speaking of Lena Horne, as she had many lovers, like one would if you had the charm and beauty she had, she also was intertwined with Orson Welles, who is also on this list. At the same time, the director, writer, and actor Orson Welles was making groundbreaking films and radio programs. He was also under FBI investigation as a potential communist and political subservient. Welles was targeted in part because of his progressive political stances, but the suspicions only grew 
after the release of his classic 1941 film Citizen Kane, whose main character served as a thinly veiled reference to the anti-communist news mongol William Randolph Hearst. The evidence before us leads inevitably to the conclusion that the film Citizen Kane is nothing more than the extension of the Communist Party, campaign to smear one of its most effective and consistent opponents in the United States, one FBI report has read. But the Bureau had never actually found any evidence that Wells himself was a Communist Party member, but it still added him to the index of people believing to be a threat to national security. His name would then later appear in the 1950s Red Channels, as mentioned before with this blacklist thing, as part of the pamphlet, but then he had to have already entered long periods of self-imposed exile in Europe. Ah yes, the most prolific actress of the silent era to the era of color on film, Marlene Dietrich, was known for her sultry eyes, her low timbre tone, and her love for fashion regardless of gender. But she was also a notable woman who understood the difference between honoring your homeland and nationality, and knowing when said homeland has done extreme wrongs and perceived on detaching oneself from it. See, Madame Dietrich refused to work with or in the German regime in World War II despite being offered highly paid contracts. Marlene Dietrich was never a political artist, nor did she actually flee the fascists to the American continent, and yet she was consistent in her opposition to the dictator's regime, rise in Germany, and showcase her support for the United States. She also raised money to help Jews escape Germany, as Marlene Dietrich detested the fascist government and its ideologies after their mustache leader came to power. And so she only went to Austria or France when she visited Europe. In 1937, she applied to become a US citizen and permanently moved to the US as a permanent resident in the USA as a requirement for citizenship. She finally became an American in 1939. She toured for years in the United States and Europe to promote war bonds and to entertain the American troops, but when she would visit her homeland after the war, German audience could not forgive her actions. In fact, they felt that she was a deserter and she was also spat and booed at performances in Germany in 1960. In her own words, she notes, It is not an easy decision to change your nationality, and if you suddenly despise the opinions and methods that your birthplace espouses, even if you try to persuade yourself to the opposite to have to repudiate everything that as a child you learned to honor, it makes you feel disloyal. The love and respect for the country that has welcomed you has nothing to do with this, as she noted it's important to criticize things you see as wrong, even if it's the land you grew up in or the land you were made to believe was doing right. But once you see past of what was fed to you and educate yourself of the sufferings of other people, you know morally where your consciousness lies. Like Josephine Baker, another amazing woman and actress, wanted to make her living in her home and started out as a vaudeville performer even as a baby. When she was married at the age of 13, she got divorced a year later and married once again and divorced once more. But after all, she still had a love for performing despite having to work as a maid for a rude and discriminative family, she went to travel to Europe. After a successful run, she thought, well, if the people in France enjoy my work, maybe back home we'll do the same. As a result, the Jim Crow laws and racial discrimination was still at its peak, and the vile prejudice Josephine had to face made her self-exile back to Paris, where she could be herself. There, she flourished as a wonderful and unique performer that was beloved throughout all of France and Europe. Her famous banana skirt in Chiquitita Cheetah has been a trademark of her earlier years, and her fame was so demanding that she would have a man asking for her hand in marriage every day and every night. But Josephine, aside being being the bem femme de son temps, she was also a spy. Because her fame and flamboyant lifestyle, rival troops could not suspect her for her espionage for France. The entertainer did hide secret photographs under her dress, carried along sheets of music with information about German troops' movements in France written in invisible ink, and she would also have notes sewed into her undergarments and would be sure that everything was out of reach of interrogation. She at one point was worried, saying my notes could have been highly compromised had they been discovered, but who would dare search Josephine Baker to the skin? She later wrote when they asked her for papers, they also meant autographs. Even past World War II, she continued to work with the French resistance and American diplomats. The known Dante's Inferno or The Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri is a marvel work of thick textbook art filled with quirks and diamond analogies for one's journey to hell. But the 14th century epic poem written by the Italian writer was also exiled. Dante was a soldier in his earlier years and was always ambitious in the politics of Florence, his birthplace. Tragically, his views landed him on the losing side and his party, the White Guelphs, supported freedom from papal interference in the Florentine affairs. The opposing Black Guelphs supported the Pope in Rome and much intrigue and changes of government the Black Guelphs triumphed. Accused of corruption and financial wrongdoing, Dante was exiled from Florence for the first two years in 1302 after he refused to pay a fine. Shortly after, he was banned for life and threatened with execution at the stake of beheading if he returned. Dante refused any pardon that required him to admit guilt against the city he so loved, and in his work of divine comedy holds part of his desperation and hope and longing to return to his birthplace after so many years of being exiled. In parts of his work, he writes, If it should happen, if this sacred poem, this work so shared by heaven and by earth, that has made me lean through these long years can ever overcome the cruelty. That bars me from the fair fold where I slept, a lamb opposed to 
to wolves that wore on it. But by then, the other voice and the other fleas, I shall return as poet and put on on my baptismal font and the laurel crown. But this longing for home brought forth one of many unique and pitiful written works of time. Speaking of exiled writers, Victor Hugo, sometimes nicknamed the Ocean Man, was a French romantic writer and politician. During a literary career that spanned more than 60 years, he wrote a variety of genres and forms, and his most famous work are the novels The Hunchback of Notre Dame and Les Miserables. But aside his books and writings, he too was exiled, and when Louis Napoleon III seized complete power in 1851, establishing an anti-parliamentary constitution, Hugo openly declared him a traitor to France. He moved to Brussels, then Jersey, from which he was expelled for supporting Jersey's newspaper who had criticized Queen Victoria, but then Hugo's exile lasted until the return of liberty and the reconstitution of the Republic in 1870. Enforced at the beginning, exile later became a voluntary gesture and for the amnesty of 1859, an act of pride. In the meantime, writing and reflecting his choices, he still spoke with honesty as well as reflected in his writing on how one views others from poor to the ugly, or what is perceived to look ugly. Even with his reflections of his life, he says life's greatest happiness is to be convinced we are loved. The supreme happiness of life in its conviction is that we are loved, loved for ourselves, or rather in spite of ourselves. Hope is the word for which God has written on the brow of every man, and Victor Hugo was a prominent French author as well as a member of the European abolition movement and his opinions on things like public execution, like the guillotine remains. To him, the guillotine, which was very hyped at the time, is an ultimate expression of the law and its name is in vengeance and is not neutral, nor does it allow us to remain neutral. All social questions achieve their finality around that blade. The scaffold of an image is not merely a framework, a machine, a lifeless mechanisms of wood, iron, and rope. And speaking of criticizing one's government into exile, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, during the 1750s and 1760s, Rousseau produced his best known books mainly as novels and writings criticizing political parties, government ran sanctions, and the royal monarchs and the systems that had differentiated the poor from the rich, which is still very prevalent today. Many philosophers like Jean considered intellectual questions about the family and individuals in it, like what was family in its nature, state of existence before civilizations, and how did mothers and fathers act, how are children raised, and so on and so forth. Claiming on this social contract, man is born free everywhere but is in change, he argued that the human government is in contract between people who are run in government than those who are governed by it. People who are entered into contracts because life without government would be too difficult, and they expect the government to respect their individual rights while providing security and happiness. Being critical of religion and government, it actually what is the reason why he was exiled. He traveled to Switzerland where his books had also offended authorities and who had ordered his arrest and fleeing to England, he remained there until 1767. And when he returned to France, he lived under the protection of powerful friends until his death in 1778. Louis Bunel, like all people who saw the changes in their government policies in real time, and sees the injustices caused by said government, it can change a lot in a person, especially in Louis Bunel's life was just like that and so many others. Born in Spain, he was given the chance to study art and music and had an eye for film. And when he was in the University of Madrid, he learned an endless source of liberal thoughts as the Residencia de Estudiantes was a hotbed for young men interested in art, music, literature, and politics. He became friends with two rising stars, Federico Garcia Lorca and the painter Salvador Dali. Integrating with eccentric minds brought to him in place of making his own films, there he exposed topics unheard of, discussed through art, visionary controversial conversations, and that would be buried under the rug that would be considered so controversial. Brought in right-wing protesters to wreck the cinema, showing his film, censored, banning it, and trying to blacklist anyone attached to his work. Shocked by the public of that party, he was inspired by socialist republic groups in Spain and encouraged the voices of those who opposed the military, the church, and fascist regime. Returning to France in 1936, he acted as well as a spy and a propagandist for the republican government and in exile until fearing assassination by the fascist agents. He left with his wife and his young son to the United States, vowing to never to return to a fascist Spain, and he remained in exile until 1960. And finally our boy, Charlie Chaplin. Surprisingly, the silent film extraordinaire was also exiled at one point, though never a member of a communist party, silent screen icon Charlie Chaplin drew the ire of the government of his subservient films and supported leftist political causes. The little tramps creator skewered into the capitalist and industrial society with movies such as The Modern Times and The Great Dictator and Monsieur Verdot. And he was later denounced as a communist sympathizer after he donated money to defense for Dalton Trumbo and the Hollywood 10. The FBI, meanwhile, compiled a file on Chaplin that was over 2,000 pages long, and the tensions finally came to head in 1952 when Chaplin's British national was denied his re-entry visa to the United States after a trip abroad. Told he needed to testify and uh, before he could regain the permit, and the director actor instead cut ties with America and spent the rest of his career working in Europe, save for a 1972 trip collecting an honorary Oscar. Either way, he made history as the most memorable actors of our time. And speaking of history, that's all for today. Thank you for joining me. Be sure to like and subscribe. My name is Jess, and I wish you all the best. Bye.